So anything you're doing in your life, whether it's, you know, eating a bowl of M&Ms every day after lunch or eating your vegetables or working out or allowing yourself rest and not forcing a workout when you're recovering from an illness, anything in your life, it's you look at it and say, do I want to have it that if you do, here's how, if you don't, here's how to undo. So it's just step first stepping back and getting that awareness of what habits you actually want to do. People don't realize how much of our life is driven by habits. Okay, here we are. Here we are. Here we are. Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of I Love Being Sober, brought to you by Camelback Recovery, a proud partner to the most effective way to achieve long-term recovery. My name is Tim Westbrook, and I'm the CEO and founder of Camelback Recovery here in the always sunny and always sober Scottsdale, Arizona, where my team and I, over the course of many years, have helped thousands of people on their path to recovery. We started this show because there's so much misinformation about addiction treatment, mental illness, and recovery in general. There's so much more to recovery than just going to inpatient treatment, seeing a therapist, and going to 12-step meetings. All of those things are important, and AA saved my life. However, to find long-term recovery and live happy, joyous, and free, there's a lot more to it than just stopping the drinking, stopping the drugs, stopping the sex addiction, or stopping any addictive behavior, for that matter. Sobriety and recovery can and should be fun. And that's not to say that the recovery process is going to be easy, and it's not to say that there won't be difficult times ahead. However, to live the life that you deserve and for it to be exciting and fun, you will need to change a few things about the way you live your life. This includes new healthy lifestyle habits that promote your mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical health. And that, my friends, will lead you to living a kick-ass sober life. Visit CamelbackRecovery.com to learn more about treatment, recovery coaching, sober living, and your next step to freedom and happiness. Our guest today is an attending emergency medicine physician at one of the busiest level one trauma centers in the country, as well as practicing medicine in an underserved rural critical access hospital. Working successfully in these high stress high stakes environments, in addition to her fellowship in medical education, has given her the skills she needs to teach her audience how they too can thrive in any environment or in any situation. As a dual cert board certified physician and assistant professor, she teaches stress management skills, resilience, confidence, and healthy habit creation and maintenance. She utilized her years of research and teaching about healthy habits to write her first book, Habit That, which hit number one bestseller status in multiple categories on Amazon within 24 hours of release. Today, we're going to talk about healthy habit creation and maintenance, resilience and stress, stress growth, and overcoming imposter syndrome. Dr. Jamie Hope, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. I realize that's a, a big menu of topics and awesomeness, but it makes such a difference and anything I could do to help support the sober community, people struggling with mental health and addiction. It, these are people I'm very passionate about helping. As you have talked about, we see a lot of places that don't necessarily get it right. And then mm -hmm. people that do, and it's amazing that can make such a difference. Absolutely. And I, I have your book and I was reading it and I don't know what happened to it. I think it's in the other room, but it's a great book. Um, I don't know how, how long ago you wrote that book, but it's, but it's relevant, obviously, it's still relevant today, and it's a, it's a good read for anybody out there that uh, is looking for a good book to pick up. Well, thank you. I, I put there was a lot of passion poured into that. It was just pre-pandemic, and so. Um, but it's interesting that looking back at it now and going through some of the questions and things I did, it, it's still relevant because the principles of human behavior change are kind of evergreen. As you, there's always some newfangled technology or new latest and greatest treatment, et cetera, but we're still humans and we need yeah. human nature has been unchanged for an awfully long time. <laughs> right, right. And so when I first started putting together the book, even some publishers are like, you can't just tell people to eat better and exercise. That isn't sexy. You need a, the, what is the newest, latest, greatest magical beans? And I don't, I don't do that. I don't do, I don't do fake. I don't do magic beans. So it's right. like, well, then I'll just. Do it myself and share this yeah, with and you, people. Yeah, and you talk you talk about the fad diets. You talk about I mean, you, there's a bunch of stuff that you talk about in the book, which is is fantastic. 
and it um, there, there's a, there's a lot. We'll we'll get into it, but but first, tell tell me a little bit about your background and how you you got to kind of where you're at today. Yeah, okay. so I am first generation college, so I didn't come from a long line of doctors and with this expectation. And I, I think that's really important because, you know, as I was growing up, there were people who helped encourage me along the way. And there are also people who are detractors and, and not that helpful. So it was a moment of finding that North Star within me happened when I was pretty young. So picture this. I am 10 years old. I am jumping on a trampoline with my BFF, Erica. Yes. Okay. Now, this is in the way back machine here. So there were no, none of these safety nets on the side of the trampoline. <laughs> there right, was right. No padding. I mean, it was rusty springs on the side of it. We might as well have sprinkled some broken glass around it and just like, you know, make yeah, it. Right, right. And so we're jumping with this other big kid, Ben. And as one does, Erica and Ben hit the trampoline at that exact right magical moment that creates the big bounce. And so Erica went up over the rusty springs and onto the ground and screamed immediately. So I slide across, jump down and look at her. And even with my 10 year old non-medically trained eyes, I recognize that Erica's elbow is pointing in a direction that elbows should definitely not bend. And I remember thinking at the time, Tim, seriously, I'm looking at the elbow thinking, what if we just kind of move it this way? Can we put that back into place as a, as a 10 year old? And of course, Erica was apparently the cooler head in that minute because she said no you weirdo go get my mom <laughs> don't, <laughs> right, right, right. don't get medical care and i remember being a little frustrated with myself that i didn't know how to reduce a fractured dislocated elbow at 10. so i started educating myself i went to the library as i love to tell my kids i am older than the internet they're they'll, they're still mildly shocked and horrified um, yeah. and started reading books about first aid and and things like that and so despite being discouraged, despite not necessarily having a clear path laid out for me, not seeing anybody, I just, I knew it was who I was fundamentally as a person. And so I just, I continued to go straight through kind of, I'm not a outwardly defiant person. So I just kind of quietly did it anyway. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it matters to me getting to help people makes a difference. And so now as an ER doc, I see people on the worst day of their life. It's a, it's a regular Tuesday morning for me. It is the worst day of their life. And that is so important to be present, healthy, all of these things for my patients. And then the rest of my career is dedicated to helping people upstream so they don't have that worst day of their life. And that's why I'm so passionate about this. So you, so you knew at 10 years old that you wanted to help people and you wanted to work as a doctor, mm -hmm. is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, so did you ever veer from that or was that always kind of in your mind, that's what you wanted to do? You were planning on being pre-med, you were planning on going to medical school. Is that how it always was for you? Mostly. I also definitely wanted to be one of the fly girls on In Living Color. Uh, okay, okay, okay. That also came up. You know, I, I, I went through the typical gamut of astronaut, marine biologist, because, you know, as most kids think, marine biologist means you get to hug dolphins all day. And when I found out that wasn't true, I was like, well, that... I'm, I'm no longer in. And then yeah. the, the other thing I ever considered very seriously is teacher, which physician is Latin for teacher. And I, as an assistant professor and a, and a speaker, I get to have that passion. I was a little afraid to tell people what I wanted to do. So when I initially applied to college, I applied as a journalism major, got some good scholarships. And then on that first day at pre-med orientation, I just went over to the science office and changed my major. And never just like that. Okay. Right there. I just, I, I knew it was right. Where now, where did you, where'd you grow up? Michigan. So I'm in the Detroit area. It's probably hard okay. to tell by the absurd number of plants in my office because in the winter here, there's seasonal affective disorder is real. And so uh -huh. um, it is in the fifties now, which uh, I'm legitimately wearing a sleeveless shirt and shorts right now. So I'm, I'm sure. Cause, you, that, that, Cause that's nice and cool. No, it's delightful. You'd probably be in a parka. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The Arizona folks don't do it like that. But yeah, it's it's great. I've I have lived in other places, but this is where my family is. This is my home. And working in one of the busiest level one trauma centers outside of Detroit, this is the community that I love and serve. So where where did you go to med school? Michigan State University. Spartans out there. So you never so you so you never left Michigan. I did well no, I lived in London, I lived in Costa Rica, but I always came back home. 
this is so mm -hmm. this is my home i apparently enjoy uh cold weather and really bad football teams i had a conversation okay. talking about the super bowl and i was like don't say that to lions fans it's just not nice it's not nice okay so um now what so what made you want to work in because because now you, you're a doctor you want to be a doctor you're on that path mm -hmm. what made you decide to want to work in a trauma center so, well, it, it's a little funny it, as you go through medical school, it's, it, it's a little bit of a sorting. So you try the different rotations. So I did my rotation in family medicine and I said, oh, I love this. And then I did my family ro or my rotation in OB and I, I was, oh, I love this. And I did my rotation in PEDS and I was like, oh crap, I love this too. What, you know, what are you supposed to do? You have to, with very limited data, decide what you want to be when you grow up before you're even done going through all the training. Cause there's, cause, cause there's all these different. Yeah. There's, there's different directions you can go. Right. And you have to pick. And once you pick, are you kind of like, are you, are you kind of stuck? A, a little bit. So you, you go to residency, there's match day, which we just had recently. And this, this horrific algorithm that tells you like, this is where you get to go as opposed to some level of free will. Um, there's some in there. It's a very strange issue, but and so typically you're supposed to already know what you want to do long before the match happens. And which was just uh, March 18th, but December of the match year, I had I had applied to a bunch of programs, you know, top great places, then this is awesome. And then I did my first true month at the emergency department. And I was like, oh no, this is the one. And it's hard to switch there, but I did it. And I got my first choice program, which is awesome. Um, it can be a little trickier for other people. Sometimes they'll do a year or two in a different specialty and then switch. But I always tell all of my learners, and everyone, even people who aren't in medicine, you're never really stuck. Why, why, why do we ever have to decide what we want to be when we grow up? I'm still working on it. I'm pretty sure I'm going to be a fly girl someday. Uh -huh. so, never give up what you think you might want to be when you're really connected. You, you are a little stuck, but there's always a way. Right. And so you're so you're in it and this is what you're doing. And it seems like there's no there's no sort of normalcy to that. I mean, as a doctor, I mean, you could have a, a job where there, where there's stability and you go to the office from nine to five, but, but what you do, there's nothing normal about it. No, it's hard for people to explain. And they'll, people ask me when I'm traveling at conferences or at dinner, what's the craziest thing you've ever seen? And I'm like, I'm not going to trauma dump on you. You don't, you don't want to know. You just want to hear the story yeah. about things, people stuck in what places you don't really want to see the level of depth of human trauma that I've seen. And I heard a quote once that's, that really helped sustain me. It takes a remarkable person to enter the pain of a stranger. And that's what I do. And it, it's very, very hard for people to imagine what that's like. And even pre-pandemic, I mean, just the, all the things we saw, and then my hospital in particular during the first waves took the brunt of it. We had It was New York, Washington, and Detroit. And my hospital took most of that. So in addition to all these other things, people didn't stop having car accidents and strokes and heart attacks mm -hmm. and shot and human trafficking and abuse and then more. So it, it, it is, it's, we work weekends, we work holidays. You, we got to be there. Now, are you, how often are you in the trauma center? Are you working? I mean, is it 40 hours? Is it 50 hours? Is it 80 hours? I mean, what, what is a, a typical work week? How much time are you, are you, are you working in the trauma center? So the glorious thing about that is the answer is it varies because uh -huh. it's shift work. So we walk in, we do 10 hours with no break, right? There's no lunch break. There's no whatever. So you, you walk in at the beginning of your shift, you accept all of the patients from your colleague who is about to leave. You take the baton so they can just go. And mm -hmm. then for 10 hours, you see, everyone that comes in that door, everything, no matter whether it's house fire, car accident, gunshot, like everything. And then at the end of your time, you pass the baton and go home. No one calls you, nothing like that. So whether your shift is a midnight shift, a day shift, a, a holiday shift, you do that. And so what that looks like, so, you know, how many 10 hour shifts can one do in a month? Okay. And dial that down to what is healthy and safe. Because uh, I think that self-care component is really nice. And so I will, I, I'm very fortunate to work in a wonderful place. So I can kind of mold my shifts, my number and around my lifestyle. I, I, 
I'm a mother, I'm a speaker, I travel, I go to Genius Network where we hang out and all these things. And so that week, I'm not gonna do any shifts because I'm either traveling or home with the kiddos. And then, so then the next week I might do, you know, a bunch of shifts. So it's really cool, unlike an office job that it has so much flexibility. Right. Well, and I guess you don't, uh, to your point, you, you're you on for 10 hours and then you're off. Yeah. And so you don't have any patients necessarily that need to talk to you because you're their doctor. Right. And so, and, and that's what it's nice about it. So then when we're there, we're taking care of everyone. And then when we're not there, we're taking care of our families and ourselves. So what inspired you to write your book, Habit That? So that's kind of also a, a little bit of a silly story. So at our medical school, we, there's a course called Promotion and Maintenance of Health. And I was going through it as a, you know, I'm an assistant professor. What kind of things do I want to help with and teach? I was like, Promotion and Maintenance of Health. Great. That's really consistent with my upstream practices that I do to help people. And I go to one of it and I met the professor who runs the class and she's wonderful. One of, seriously, one of my favorite humans. But the speaker she had that time that was teaching behavior change was so bad. I seriously considered faking my own death to get out of there. It was, Shut up. oh, it was so bad. I'm looking daggers at her. I'm like, this is terrible. What, what the heck? None of the students are paying attention. This is your one shot to teach future doctors how to help people. Oh. So then the next class that person was supposed to teach, I showed up to, and it was like three inches of snow that day. I mean, for, for us, that's a, that's a dusting. That doesn't even count. You don't even shovel yeah. for three inches in Michigan. That's, and the other person, the, the other woman who was teaching this, this horrible course didn't show up. And so the professor who runs it looked at me and she's like, hope you want this. And I was like, oh yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. And so I, you know, it's what I got to do kind of by showing up. And so I'm teaching future physicians how to actually help their patients make changes. And I'm telling them, your patients don't care how well you've memorized the Krebs cycle and whatever. You can make all these amazing evidence-based recommendations, but if you don't listen to your patients, connect with them, respect who they are and their circumstances, they're not going to take your recommendations. And then who did you actually help? And, and so I throw, I poured so much passion into that and I realized I can only teach so many classes. And so I wrote the book for the patients in case huh. doctor sucks at doing this. Cause let's be real. A lot of them do. Cause it's, it's not adequately taught in traditional MD training, which I am. And then of course I have spent a, a, a lot of extra time getting additional training beyond that, because I think we need to marry all of those things together. And so what's the main, the main goal of the book? So to take, so the, the title have it that, so anything you're doing in your life, whether it's, you know, eating a bowl of M&Ms every day after lunch or eating your vegetables or working out or allowing yourself rest and not forcing a workout when you're recovering from an illness, anything in your life, it's, I, you look at it and say, do I want to have it that if you do, here's how, if you don't, here's how to undo. So it's just step first, stepping back and getting that awareness of what, habits you actually want to do. People don't realize how much of our life is driven by habits. Like imagine you're about to brush your teeth, right? You probably start on the same side every single time, don't you? Oh yeah. Uh -huh. I, I don't That's a habit. Yeah. Now you're probably not up agonizing over which side of your mouth you start brushing your teeth on. That's, that's a habit that's fine to just allow. We put our pants on the same leg generally. Um, and so using those truths of human nature, when you want something to become a habit, it is it should be low cognitive load, low choice, easy, repeatable. And so choosing what you want to have it and then putting it in that pathway so you can do that. So just, just as much as eating your vegetables every day or moving your body or doing your breath work or do, doing your program and working your program, I want it to be a habit that's just as easy as brushing your teeth. Now, they, they say 95% of our thoughts are subconscious, right? And so you want things to be on autopilot. And is that is that the same thing? Yes, exactly. Yep. Uh, the more autopilot, you just so you pick the habits you want on autopilot. It takes a little work. But then right. when you're autopiloting them, then it just becomes a part of who you are. So you've got 5% of your thoughts that are conscious, which and what that tells me is that there's only so many new habits that we can create daily, weekly, monthly, whatever. Would you agree with that? Well, maybe, maybe. Um, but then, so you just take what, the, what you really don't create and then dump it into your subconscious so it doesn't take up that effort of that 5%.
Right. So, right. I mean, it takes a little while before it becomes subconscious, though. And that's what I mean. Is yeah. at, at a time, there's only so many things, only so many new habits that we can create at one time. Yes. And so people, and that's one of those things where you really have to know yourself. Some people are kind of all in. Like my sister, I love her. She's my birthday buddy. She's one of my favorite humans. She goes from not working out to being a competitive power lifter. No middle ground, right? I am okay. the tortoise. I am slow, boring, consistent. I think today will be my 734th consecutive day of working out. I'm not trying to be a competitive power lifter. It's just, it's for my mental health and it's consistent. So some people kind of need to be all in on something. And some people are more the slow, steady, add one at a time. So understanding who you are will help give you much better success. Now, before you wrote this book, did you already have this habit creation thing down before you started writing the book? Did you already think about it? Was it already a conscious thing for you? Or did you really put more energy into it once you started writing this book? No, it was it was there. The book was just kind of a the culmination of all the stuff I had been doing. So if I could describe my teenage, like young 20s diet as anything, it would be Cheeto Tarian, which is not okay. Right. I claim uh -huh. to be a vegetarian, but I didn't actually eat any vegetables. So that doesn't seem very authentic. <laughs> okay. Okay. I just was going through a random phase where I was avoiding meat. Uh, but not for health purposes and not that I was nourishing my body. And I, you know, you have those moments and I'm thinking, gosh, I really am so excited to help teach patients how to make health protective long-term behavior changes. And it's going to be so awkward to do that with Cheeto dust on my white coat. Mm -hmm. And so I was, okay. So I never had to do this big weight loss journey, be it the metabolism of your teens and early twenties, plus some genetics that I didn't have to struggle with that. But I knew patients were going to struggle with behavior changes. And I wondered, what does that look like? So I needed to start the journey for myself. And I started with the, something very simple. That was my keystone habit, the first thing I chose, which was just drinking more water. And so I, I wrote out a piece of paper with check boxes on it. And I put it up in my closet in my college apartment. And my roommate was like, what a weirdo. Um, and I would check off how much water I drank every day. And it didn't take long for me to realize, because at first I, I wasn't drinking enough water. And then after a while, I didn't have to check it off anymore. It became, I have, and I was like, oh, okay, yeah, there's some magic in that. So then I started you know, researching, really learning. I added vegetables, which was hard, because I was I used to wear a name tag that said, I'm a picky eater. It's, a, it's uh -huh. an identity. You got, we got to let go of the name tags. I, I literally buy people these, hello, my name is name tags. And we talk about peeling them up, the name tag effect. If we have time, we'll talk about that. Okay. But, but so, so then adding vegetables, which was kind of painful at first. I hated everything, but now I love vegetables so much. I'll eat seven to 10 servings of vegetables in a day. And, and it's just become part of who I am. So I've, I've done it. I also made plenty of mistakes. And sometimes I made multiple times just to really drive the point home to myself. Um, mm -hmm. And but 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 it gets there. And so the the book was kind of a fun way to express what I had learned from my patients who are so amazing and from my own struggles. So if I can help save people a little bit of struggle, then that's that would be amazing. And by helping other people, how has that helped you? You know, it makes me feel it makes me feel really good uh -huh. because seeing that shared traumatic humanity in the ER and just knowing that not all of this had to have happened. We didn't have to end up here. This could have been prevented. So it makes me feel really good. There's no, you know, if, if a patient has a heart attack, we have a specific metric. They have to get up to the cath lab, get their blood vessel open by this time. And we get an, an email like, yeah, you did it. There's no email like, hey, you helped somebody by reading this book. And they did the things and they ate more vegetables and less Cheetos. And they never had that heart attack that I had to get them up to the cath lab. There's no email for that. There's no trophy, but it's there and it's real. And that matters so much to me. Well, and I would say there's uh, the, the fourth level of learning is you teach someone else. So not only by, by you teaching someone else, you're just further solidifying your own habits. Yes. To where they're like, like, these are my habits. This is, and there's more accountability, right? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. you, you have to continue. You don't, you can't go off of the path because if you bad. do, then you're a bad, then it'll look bad and you're a bad example. So all of the, the things that go along with writing the book 
um, yeah. include you're still healthy, you're mm -hmm. still fit, you still feel great about yourself, and you're helping other people, which is what leads to fulfillment, which is what we're all after. Yes. And uh, uh, to amplify what you said, learning to, learning something as if you're going to teach it makes all the difference. I try and teach my kids that. I teach my learners that. If you can learn it to a level where you teach it, you you, mm -hmm. do, you own it more. And so, and people teach what they need to learn. So all of the things I teach, healthy habit creation and maintenance, I didn't have that. Uh, overcoming imposter syndrome, I had that. Uh, resilience and stress growth, I needed that. Okay. And so that's why I teach in those spaces and they're applicable to mental health. They're applicable to people in recovery because those are all just different ways we're struggling with the same type of pain. Right. What, um, why do most people fail at, not that this is all about dieting, but right. why do people, why do most people fail at diets? So well, that's, that's a great example. You can use that as a proxy example for most of human behavior change. And that's mm -hmm. kind of what people want to talk about. So it, it's it's a variety of things. So people want to come, people come to me because they want the healthy habits and they want me to they want to skip to step 10 and say, OK, what is the magic diet that I can do and get this, you know, this before and after picture? But, you know, in, in 10 minutes, like it's an infomercial and that right. doesn't happen that way. Um, and right. it's, it's like, whoa, 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 before we get to the magic diet, which, by the way, I have lots of commentary about because um, there's not. It's way, let's start way back at the beginning. So starting with what is your why? Because they, people say, like, it's New Year's resolutions. They're they're um, almost like a joke because, you know, you throw up the confetti and you're like, yay, I, I'm going to do this. And the whole Zig Ziglar thing, they're not actually resolutions, they're confessions. Because you don't have any type of plan behind it. You're like, it's mostly, I confess I should lose weight. I confess I should quit smoking. I confess I should save more money. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, a goal without a plan is a wish. It's Anton St. Exupery, very famous quote. And so people are trying to start way farther ahead instead of stepping back to the basics of human behavior change. And then we also get this hedonic uh, thing that is so common. It was like, well, I ate one piece of cake. I'm a failure and I'm worthless and I'm a loser. I might as well eat the whole cake and then mm -hmm. start again on Monday or the first of the month or New Year's. So it's, yep. it, it, there's a multiple steps in here. And, and I, I've definitely seen that with people in recovery as well. They're like, well, I, I screwed up, so I might as well just drink the whole bottle. Screw it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The what, one is too many and a thousand is never enough. So it, and it happens in so many things. And so we have that. And so those are some big reasons that people fail and they're, they are also overcomeable. I like to make up words. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, um, <clears throat> what are the four pillars of health? So these are, and I choose these descriptors intentionally, nourishing food, energizing mm -hmm. exercise, not, not crazy over exercising, energizing exercise, restorative mm -hmm. sleep and stress release. And those are all interwoven, which I, I feel like in the book, I didn't ever emphasize this enough with meaningful connection. Because as people say, right. you know, connection is the opposite of addiction. Connection is the opposite of depression, that that kind of thing. And I I wish I had done a better job weaving that in more in the book with those four pillars. And so how how does what how does someone know what they should focus on first? So that is an excellent question. And so it is this opportunity to get kind of you got to get real. You got to get raw. You got to get naked with yourself. That's I, I, right. I jokingly yeah. did um, a talk at Genius Network about like everybody needs to get naked. And I was like, OK, well, now before everybody starts stripping, I'm not trying to get us arrested. Let's uh, right. I actually mean by that. So it's very interesting. Even when people record their foods for apps and stuff like that, a lot of times they're not trying to be intentionally deceptive. It's just easy to forget that you walked by that bowl of M&Ms and, and grabbed stuff. and. Uh -huh. You know, yeah. thing. Um, uh, my former mother-in-law, who's, you know, God rest her soul. She's a wonderful person, um, died of pancreatic cancer. But we would go to a restaurant and she would order a bunch. Of, she's like, let's just do appetizers, which in most situations are probably the least healthy things on the menu. She'd order yeah. a bunch of appetizers, eat everyone else's fries that she didn't order, order a tiny little salad. And you'd ask her later and like, what'd you have for dinner? She's like, oh, I had a salad. Like, oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're like, I'm like I, I saw that. Uh, 
So, but it's that level of, you got to get really real with yourself. How much nourishing food? And so the, the concept that I used was born from Michael Burnoff, who I, I know you know, um, yep. wonderful person. I love learning from him. And he talked about how food is four different things. I really simplified it to two. So food is two things, in my opinion. It is either nourishing or entertainment, period. And it's not period. that hard to figure out which, right? Like broccoli, nourishing, Cheetos, entertaining. And so you mm -hmm. got to get really real with yourself and say, how much nourishing food are you actually getting versus how much entertaining food? And then start to look at that ratio. As a healthy person, I want you at least 70% nourishing to 30% entertaining or higher in terms of the nourishing. And then your exercise. We've got pretty objective measures. Like everybody has a watch or a whoop or an aura or, or things like that. So you can get some objective data on that. It's a little harder to hide. Um, when you look at your thing at the end of the day and you're like, I've only had 2000 steps today. That's <laughs> right. Um, there are lots of great sleep trackers and sleep apps right now. How many hours are you really sleeping? And is it restorative sleep? Do you wake up out of bed on time and say like, great, I'm ready to take on the day and your stress relief. You can't hide stress from the body. It will manifest itself no matter how much you pretend it doesn't. So whether that's headaches, jaw tension and tightness, a tightness in your throat, heart palpitations, chest pain, shortness of breath, GI upset. A lot of people get that little gurgly situation, mm -hmm. muscle tension, fatigue, snappiness, you know, arguing with your, your partner or your kids or, or other people and just being annoyed. Everyone in traffic drives like an idiot it, or reaching for something, whether it's um, gambling or sh over shopping or a substance it or a, giant thing of ice cream it's that reaching is also an indicator you can't hide stress from your body so lots of different ways we look at it first so we understand and you can start i mean you can start with any of them or all of them it's knowing yourself as a person and just one thing at a time to get your body back to that healthy balanced state i think all, all this it just makes me i i think about um being in recovery from addiction being mm -hmm. in recovery it's not just stopping the drinking and the drugs. It's all the other things too. It's yeah. the eating healthy, exercising, getting enough sleep, not getting too stressed out, journaling, praying, meditating, all the things that healthy human connections, fulfilling human connections, deep human connections. These are all the things that are necessary to, I guess, feel like the person you want to be, feel happy, joyous, and free. And I think that's similar to um, eating, it's not just eating the right food. It's eating healthy, it's exercising, it's getting enough sleep, it's not hanging out with uh, negative people, right? Yeah. Being, oh, yeah. putting yourself in an environment that is conducive to um, living living a happy, healthy life. Yes. There's there's all those things, right? Well, it may, they make a difference. And even with, even with substance abuse, we always know, it, it was never really about the substance. That was the vehicle. Right. It's that was the that was the solution. The substance was the solution, right? And so, in continuing those these other healthy pillars and nourishing components, that's what matters. And that's why I love the work you do. You've had some of the most amazing guests on, some really interesting people. It's thought provoking, and it is relevant even to people who aren't in the recovery space. But mm -hmm. even if you personally aren't in recovery, you know someone who is. You know, someone who's struggling with addiction there. Ca I can't imagine any person could possibly be isolated from this. No, no, it, no, <laughs> it, it, no, it's it, it. Nobody is isolated from yeah. addiction, mental illness and anybody that wants to better themselves and live a better life. I think there's the content that I push out is going to be for, for everybody, really. Yes. I mean, you've talked about like, you know, other things about healthy habits. You've talked about how to have co healthy conversations with people. You've talked about nourishing your body, how you can use energizing, um, eat new technology and some old school stuff, some breath work, like all the, those things you talk about. Those are the ways we support ourselves and continue to live our best life. And I just, I really love how you have this breadth and depth of different things people can all do to live better. Right. So uh, your goal is to teach people that they can create a habit in five minutes per day. Mm -hmm. so Absolutely. I guess, how does one determine, I think I kind of already asked this, how does one determine which pillar they should focus on first? 
So it's just- And a how does one- so you can you can look at it and after you do your kind of naked assessment and say which one is your worst or which one is your best you can start with your worst that needs the most work depending on your level of energy or you can start with one that's your best and improve it a little bit get those right. quick wins the quick learn, wins yep. learn the habit creation learn the process learn the thing and then say okay I'll, then i'll start to work on the next one and work on the next one work on the next one and so if it can, and if you make things too onerous or too big, it just feels like too much. Like telling someone, okay, you have to lose a hundred pounds. That's too much. That's too much to conceptualize. That seems yeah. so arduous. How about we start with doing five minutes of extra movement every day? And let's, you know, the, the big goal, sure, that's a great future vision, but what can you do now that is going to be empowering and keep you on that journey? What are the what are the easy wins? I think that's the, that's the thing to think about. What are the easy wins? Now, when when a person is getting clean and sober, typically they've got to change everything about the way they live. New eating <laughs> habits, new sleeping habits, new exercise habits. They pray and meditate. I mean, like like everything has to change. And I I mean, I would imagine it's similar when someone wants to get healthy and fit. They really kind of got to change everything. And that seems overwhelming to your point. If someone wants to lose a hundred pounds, it's like thinking about all the things I got to do to lose a hundred. I mean, it's easy just to go get one of those uh, gastric bypass surgeries, yeah. but that's not even going to, that's not even going to stick either. If all of the other things don't change. Exactly. It's like taking interviews. Like you don't take it one day. Now you can drink, you know, it's, it, it, it's a little bit of a bandaid. So it is what can you feel successful? And so I learned this concept from uh, this great woman, Dr. Jill Kahn, just wonderful. I met her on the um, Miracle Morning. Um, I've read the Miracle Morning for Addiction and Recovery, as you know, you know, all those kind of things. And she said, lower the bar. And I was like, at first, I like as a high achieving person, at first, everyone yeah. like clutches their pearls and they're so upset, like, oh, I can't do that. And the point is, lower the bar on what you're willing to celebrate that you did. Yeah. And there's a reason when people are in recovery, you get tags like real often, like you've been sober for one day, you've been sober for five days, like here's another tag, here's another tag, here's another tag that might not be one in five, might not be the exact ones, but you know what I mean. Yep. Here's another one, here's another one, like at one day at a time, one breath at a time, we need to celebrate those type of things. So keep keep the bar of where you wanna be, Have that, so that's your GPS location. So I wanna drive from Michigan to Scottsdale, I can get there, that is, not a short trip. My GPS is always going to be pointing at where I'm going to end up at Scottsdale so we can go have some healthy food together, but I got to get there and you have to stop right. along the way. You know, you need gas, you need sleep. So what are the little things I can do? Like, woohoo, cross the border from Michigan, Indiana, Indiana, you know, like every little step we celebrate those and give yourself the ability to check stuff off. Whoa, do we humans love a checklist? I know that yep. there are people listening who have literally put something on their checklist that they have already done just to check it off mm -hmm. as you should give yep. your credit for those and that's the reason a lot of apps or whether you're a pen and paper kind of person record everything that you did towards your journey every five minutes everything of steps so you, we can constantly be giving ourselves those little checks that tiny little bit of yes something is going in the right direction so we can feel better and continue with our gps we'll get there eventually and every step along the way also matters. Well, and as as BJ Fogg says, yeah. uh, who's the, the behavior design scientist at Stanford, he wrote Tiny Habits, which was an Amazon best-selling book as well. And people change best by feeling good, not by mm -hmm. feeling bad. So we got to feel good more yeah. often. So, I mean, he even talks about the way to start developing the habit to do push-ups is start by doing one push-up. Right? The goal is one push up, and that's a win. Um, if you want to start reading and you don't read, start by reading one line or one paragraph. And right. and, and the the reality is that you're going to do more than one push up. Yes. And eventually, you're going to do ten or twenty or fifty, but you start with one push up, and that's the win. So the the so break it down to the very smallest win possible. Celebrate your wins often. Yes. And then, and then you'll, and then you can continue from there. It, it, it make that makes such a difference. And so I was with my family, we went to zoo Tampa, which is a lovely place. 
and they have these um, vaccine things you can come do where you can come actually pet a rhinoceros, which mm -hmm. is surprisingly soft. I, I kind of wasn't expecting that. Um, okay. And meet elephants. And they talked about the way that they train elephants because we always all kind of have this elephant in the room, right? And they said they do absolutely zero negative reinforcement. First of all, this like tens of thousands of pound beast is not really interested in your negative reinforcement. But it's not even that. It's if, if I want this behavior and you do it, you get the reward. If you don't do it, I just ignore you and try to get you to do it again. We don't respond to that negative stuff. It's like you tell, everyone says this, like I tell you, don't think about a purple elephant. You think of a purple elephant. So taking uh -huh. that, that negative bit makes a difference and continuing to celebrate. You did one push up. And so I, um, I broke my hand. I would love to say it was a really good story where I was saving some babies and puppies from a bear. You know, like, yeah, uh, but yeah. It, it wasn't. It was me thinking I was much better at beach volleyball than I am. Um, and I, I went down for a, a dive and came up with my finger pointing in the wrong direction. <laughs> and I had to go through surgery and everything I had to be immobilized. I'm a physician. It's my dominant hand. I have to have Ooh. perfect use. And so prior to that, I had been doing my push-up goals, my pull-up goals. I was really proud of myself for, for a skinny girl. I can do, I could do hanging pull-ups. Like, that's uh -huh. not bad. And right. so Six weeks get mobilized and then like months of recovery. And so the first time I, you know, the whole time I can't do that. The first time I can't even do one hanging pull up. And instead of being mad at myself saying like, okay, this is where I'm starting from. Now I'll celebrate one jumping pull up. I will celebrate there you go. standing on a bench pull up. <laughs> so I'm closer to it. Each thing that we celebrate makes a difference. And we, so that is just, so important for people in recovery, for people any time on their healthy habit journey. Absolutely. And even when you're training a dog. Oh, yeah. Perfect concept. Because I'll tell you what, because I have I have a little Aussie doodle. His name's Wayne. He's the cutest thing on earth. But let me tell you, he doesn't always listen. He does not always listen. And sometimes I want to yell at him. I want to smack him. And That's it good. just doesn't it doesn't it doesn't work. It doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't thought, work. First of all, before I had kids and I had two big rescue dogs and I would compare my dogs to people's kids, they would get all offended. And then when I had kids, I was like, yeah, they're exactly like dogs. Yeah, yeah they're the same. Right. <laughs> so are we as adults. Let's not pretend it's just kids. Um, and so my 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 shepherd collie mix, she's she's fluffy, she's beautiful, she's 65 pounds. There's no punishment that will deter her from trying to snatch people food on a table if she can reach it. Like straight up doesn't care. She she took a, a hamburger out of someone's hand and didn't even graze their hand. She didn't even bite them. She just and I told my babysitter this once I made this glorious, like healthy lasagna from scratch. And I said, you have to put it up. She will get it. And she didn't believe me. She's like, there's no way this dog's going to get it. Just pushed it to the back of the stove. Dog gets on the stove. Uh -huh, of course. So you have to understand. Like, you, and you can yell at her all you want. She's like, whatever. I already ate it. <laughs> it doesn't help. So those, yeah, yeah. those negatives, the deterrents don't work. So definitely a lot more carrot and a lot less stick because we already all have enough guilt and shame. We have, we that's, have the, that's, that's the one thing that I always think about is the guilt and the shame. Like if I make a mistake, I already feel bad. And that's the same thing with other people. Uh, when I think about um, yelling at someone or telling them they're a horrible person or telling them they're stupid or whatever, yeah. I, I always think, they like we already know we made a mistake. I already know I made a mistake. Yeah. The person that made the mistake knows that they made a mistake. They're as humans, we're already so hard on ourselves. Oh yes, they're already yelling at themselves. You don't need to add to it. Right, right. Okay, so let's okay let's talk about imposter syndrome. What's imposter syndrome? So this is something I didn't know that I I didn't know the name of it when I had it. And okay. so, you know, again, there's, a, there's always a story. So um, I, I got accepted to medical school, which is great. So the medical school, they interviewed me. They looked at my resume. They already knew all the stuff I did. That, that's why they accepted me, right? And right. So they sent us a packet in the mail to, of things to papers to fill out. And one of them said, tell us about yourself. And I, I, I had other options for medical school, but I intentionally chose one that's well known for being touchy-feely because anatomy is anatomy no matter where you learn it. Like this mm -hmm. bit hole in the skull is called the same thing, whatever, whether you're at Harvard or when, 
So I wanted a place that was going to be supportive to what I knew would be a difficult journey. And I was like, oh, that is so sweet. Tell us about yourself. So I talk about my hobbies and whatever. And then they made a book. They put our picture and made it in a book and printed it out to give it to us. Again, I'm older than the internet. So they made a face book <laughs> for us. And I was like, uh -huh. oh, what an awesome idea. This is such a good way to get to know people I'm going to be on this glorious journey with. And so I'm flipping through it. And I realized that everyone else interpreted that question as an opportunity to reiterate their resume and all the cool stuff they've done. So if you are flipping through this book, it looks like my classmates have all done a bunch of amazing stuff. And you get to my page, which basically said, I like volleyball and puppies. <laughs> it felt like the biggest idiot. I was like, there, it was the first day of med school. And I was like, oh, they are for sure going to just tap me on the shoulder and be like, thanks for playing. Nice try. We're going to give your spot to someone else. And so that was one of the times I experienced it the most. And I kept seeing it I'm like, wow, you know, so med school is hard. But you look around and other people look like they've got it together. And so you think you're the only one who is struggling. You think you're the only one who feels like they don't know what they're doing or is having a hard day or sometimes wants to yell at their dog or things like you think you're the only one. So it's kind of this imposter. You're like everyone else is winning and I'm the only one here who is a loser. And it, it hurts. And this is a disease that um, thrives in the silence. It thrives in the dark. And so when you finally start sharing openly, like, hey, I'm on the struggle bus today. I was at a conference and I had met somebody. I was like, this person is amazing. They really deliver all the kind of stuff. And I was chatting with her the, the next morning. And I was like, how are you doing? She's like, girl, I'm on the struggle bus today. And I was like, I like you a thousand times more because you're a real person. Right. So we got to open that up and not all pretend that we know what we're doing and that, mm -hmm. and that we're perfect. And so to continue that, you know, even at Genius Network, they've mentioned this when people struggling with imposter syndrome, everyone else just had their multi uh, lunch. And, and you're like, well, mine wasn't enough. Oh my gosh. And yep. it's, it's silliness in there. We got to, we got to get out of that. We got to talk about it and be open. Right. Is there a question that you wanted me to ask you today I that I didn't question. ask? I do. I love that. I love this. I was excited about this one. Um, nice. So, in medicine and in this upstream work that I do, a lot of people don't necessarily know what to ask the person that's taking care of them. And so sometimes it can lead to misunderstanding or bad care. And so I always tell my patients, you know, at the end of it, when they're done asking me questions, you know, is there anything else you want to share with me? Anything else you need me to know? Anything else I can answer? And if they say no, and I say, and if you were my family member, I would tell you, I would also like you to ask me this. So let me go ahead and answer that for you. Because it, I know what, what they should be asking. Right. And to what they know they should be asking for themselves. And so never be afraid to ask somebody, whether it's your tax accountant or your, you know, you're a physician, anybody in the medical field, like at the end of the day, what else should I have asked you? Mm hmm. And it's such an important thing and it's so empowering because you're the one that gets to be responsible for your destiny in, in your health and in your life and all those things. So I love when people ask me more questions. Any doctor that is offended by a patient asking them questions needs to find a new job. There you go. And I'm not awesome. even like, I'm like, I said what I said. <laughs> I'm not even, uh, I'm not even sad. About yeah, it. no, that's, 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 that's great. Um, so yeah, I, so I think that's important. So ask like, reiterate that question forward with anybody. And so nobody's ever asked me that. And I'm really like that. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. And where can people find you? Um, if they want to find you, if they want to connect you with you, if they want to learn more about you. Sure. So, um, a couple different places. So my website is drhopehealth.com. I didn't utilize my first name and I know everyone says that's a bad branding mistake, but my parents chose the less typical spelling of it. And so my entire life, it's oh, people always spell it wrong. So I just, it's easier to, hope is really easy to spell. It's Dr. Hope. Oh. Um, and that's, you know, I'm, I'm Jamie Hope on Facebook. I'm Dr. Hope Health on Twitter. I'm starting this whole new uh, survival thing on TikTok. So, so you can find me in those places, um, you know, find the book and, or just, just keep on your healthy habit journey. Lower the bar, get your check marks, and never stop getting your way towards that destination you want. I love it. I love it. Jamie, uh, Dr. Jamie Hope, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I got a lot out of this talk, and, and I'm sure there's some people out there that learned a little bit as well. Great. Thanks.
Tim, thank you so much for having me. I love the platform. Keep doing all the amazing stuff you're doing and, and helping share and elevate people. I really appreciate you. Awesome.